Hey, 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 welcome, friends. Welcome back. Welcome to another podcast of the Regeneration Podcast. Um, we're beginning today sans our friend and comrade Michael Martin. I do believe he'll be dying in shortly. But if you're watching on YouTube or about to hear voices, you're going to recognize somebody who could almost be seen as a, he's been our most regular guest. And today he's going to be serving as something of a co host because uh, he knows the work of our main guest, Eric Wilson. I'll say the name better than I do. But we're here with uh, Guido Preparata right now and Eric Wilson. Eric, I'm going to introduce you. Thank you. By uh, just uh, mentioning, you know, my engagement with your work. I first came across your name in a book that I still think, Guido, the, the way you put together that book was genius. And I will point to, uh, I wrote a review of the book, New Directions in Catholic Social and Political Thought at Front Porch Republic. And I entitled it Avoiding the Hive, I believe. And I think it's a pretty good summary. But what Guido did there with his friends is bring together just completely different approaches. And I had to read it like two or three times, a number of papers, to kind of see what you were doing, Guido. Like the first couple essays break apart um, an anthropology, the way I would say it. You you talk about like social science and how they get at questions of obesity. And you you see that um, there's a hypocrisy in the church that we, and I've mentioned on this podcast, we look at in a lot of church language, we look at the anthropology of Catholics or Christians as persons in communion. But uh, in business schools, you go out of your way, Guido, to point out, uh, the Catholic Church reverts right back to competitive individualism or utility maximizing individuals. And what you do is you point out that duplicity, but you show that the, the, the um, self-rational seeking individual isn't even a good unit in sociology writ large. Anyhow, a couple of essays mine that territory. And then you weave in our guest this morning, and we'll talk more about the book a little bit. Uh, if we're going to get at what's going on in the world, um, our guest Eric Wilson wrote a book on the unspeakable, James Douglas's book on what he considered to be, and help me clarify this, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And something, you know, just, it's so obvious, but that the use of political murder and how things are run. Um, you know, I just I was reading somebody the other week, but it was just saying we're still waiting. Um, we can talk about permanent Washington or deep states, and we will. But somebody was just saying the role of secret police in history. Nobody's ever wrote the huge tome on that. But so, Eric Wilson, um, describe your background a little bit and welcome to the podcast. Well, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I did. Um, well, basically, um, I completed my doctorate in uh, early modern history at Cambridge. A student of Robert Spinner. And then I went down a really long path of sessional jobs uh, teaching history in various places in Canada. And then, of course, I had to make the migration to law school where I became a jurisprudence scholar fairly quickly because my history background in the Reformation and the Counter Reformation and the German Inquisition, which was the subject of my doctoral thesis. And then, which is like I like, which is why I like talking about Ratzinger sometimes. <laughs> and then uh, I wound up getting a, getting an academic position in Australia at Monash University, which I was there for 20 years before I had an early retirement for health reasons. And now I'm a full-time online uh, researcher, and I have three books in the works. One's coming out with content in October around Halloween. It will be released. It's on James Elroy. And it's called, can I use a, uh, an, a bad word online? Very good. Okay. It's called The View from Howard's Fuck Pad. <laughs> bad white, bad white men, the deep, the deep state, bad white men in the weird war of James Elroy, and that'll be in a Punkton Books in October. And we'll try to, I'll try to send you the cover of, of a photo of the cover because the cover I designed it myself. It's like you know, just beyond words. I bet. And then that's actually it's obscene itself. And uh, then I've got a book coming out of my lecture notes about the history of law, literature, and cinema with Springer, and I'm working on that. That's why I'm flat out doing that right now. And then I have another book coming out after that on the Caribbean crime novel with Lexington. And basically, the last couple of years, my research, mainly research emphasis has been on the relationship between crime literature and horror literature, the relationship between crime and horror. And that's how I kind of accidentally on purpose fell into conspiracy theory. In terms of the content of any conspiracy, I always take the position of a principled agnostic, but I like the trope of conspiracism as a way of discussing phenomena, including political, parapolitical, and uh, 
covert clandestine agencies of the state. So to me, whether or not any particular conspiracy is true, and if so, to what degree, I take it by a case-by-case -case basis, but I like using it as a discursive trope, trope to analyze and think about events which are significant but are somewhat shadowy, like the assassination of JFK, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and RFK, and at Gandhi as well, which is what James Douglas talks about in his book, Unspeakable. He's also, uh, Douglas has also produced a book on the assassination of Gandhi itself, and he sort of frames the Indian nationalist movement as being in cahoots with MI6, who wanted to turn a, an argument over whether or not India should become a nuclear power uh, under British extended neocolonial rule or not. And that may have been why Gandhi got hit in the way that he did. Uh, so that's, in a, in a nutshell, that's where I'm coming from and what I'm working on. Fascinating. And then Guido, you're going to jump in here. But for our listeners, uh, Eric, a uh, couple of things. If you could describe the work of James Douglas, you know, in his background, right. because, uh, you know, the show that, um, you know, that a lot of us, you mentioned a recent conversion to orthodoxy and so forth, and that'll yep. interest our listeners. When we call it the Regeneration Podcast, I, I think we're anchored around, you know, the church uh, mm -hmm. seen in various ways. And from there, we're looking at the, you know, the, the regeneration of politics, the regeneration of economics, you know, Guido's work comes in a lot there, the regeneration of culture, uh, the environment. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when you're when you're dealing with James Douglas, you're dealing with somebody whose background is certainly uh, rooted in the gospel. Yeah. And um, can you describe a little bit about him and maybe uh, a few minutes on your recent conversion to orthodoxy? Oh, uh, sure. As far as James Douglas is concerned, he's a radical Christian pacifist uh, Catholic. And uh, he, he sort of began his career as a political, um, an agent of political resistance in the United States during the late 60s, early 70s, about the same time James Carroll did, um, with their work, uh, basically a tent on the, the anti-nuclear program, uh, swords and plowshares, plow, the plowshare movement and that sort of thing. And uh, he spent a lot of time, if I remember this correctly, I may be wrong, but I believe they spent a lot of time trying to derail the right train Mm -hmm. That's the locomotive of the United States that moves nuclear missiles around covertly in the middle of the night from, from base to base. Um, and he sort of got thinking about uh, Christian apocalyptism and how he began sort of reverse engineering revelation and splicing it into a contemporary anti nuclear movement on the argument that. Revelations isn't really a prediction about the future, it's a cautionary warning that we can sort of preempt the future by looking at the, the apocalypse as the outcome of our collective failure to implement a radical pacifism on Earth. And we're going to ask you to keep on focusing right into the microphone. Oh, sure. sure. Our, uh, 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 Eric says he has a little problem with his computer, but I think 95% of it's been great, oh, Eric. Yeah. Oh, okay. So do you hear everything I just said or? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. So it's basically splicing Gandhi with Jesus. Revelations is a cautionary text about the not inevitability, but uh, possibility of nuclear war. And uh, of course, he's interested in, of course, in the U.S. involvement in Vietnam, because he also sort of bought into the, into the Peter Dale Scott line that the real reason for assassinating Kennedy was to derail and his, Kennedy's attempt to open up a back channel with Hanoi, Havana, and Moscow as a way. It, basically, it was sort of a, a botched, aborted attempt at det, uh, an early version of detente mm -hmm. that Nixon was unable to implement much more successfully. Later. Okay, now, Guido, jump in here a little bit. You know, you know Eric, you know me, the things we've talked about. Kind of put Eric on a stage to help yeah. our listeners kind of understand where he's breaking new ground. I, I see a lot of places where he's breaking new ground. Yeah, yeah, um, for certain, for certain. It is, um, you know, it's it's about this uh, this this ability that he has about, well, the question I have is is this, it's, it's, it's the portrayal of reality and it goes back to good and evil. And, and, um, and, and it seems like from, from Eric's approach, I don't know, from the way from from reading Eric's, you really have the impression that I don't know, I, I see things very gnostically, that very much the devil's at the console, and that the way the devil plays is through a variety of mechanisms, weird geometries, repetitions, and all sorts of patterns. And and that's what Eric detects and gives these 
um, gives these particular theoretical, um, you know, it devises these theoretical rubrics to describe exactly what sort of routine is used at every single point in time by the devil at the console. This is how I see it. Um, question, am I seeing it right or not, or am I completely off track? Second question I would have for Eric, and I, I started reading Douglas. I could never finish that book of The Unspeakable. Personally, the, all these books about heroes, yeah. me, they, they piss me off because I don't believe in right. I don't believe in heroes at all. And I don't think there are heroes. Or if there are, they're generally faceless people in the crowd that die deaths and nobody knows about them. At those levels, they're all great stage actors and they're not concerned with the well-being of humanity at all. Least of all JFK, who got to that presidency, God knows how, because that that place he took was Nixon's. Hmm. And he comes out of nowhere. And, and I don't know. So for these two questions about the, the routines of the devil, and if there is a demiurge here really running the show and God is God knows where, uh, you know, on a business trip, as I like to say, somewhere. And and what about heroes, you know? Uh, first of all, I agree with you. I don't really believe in heroes either. But when you asked me to write a chapter for your book, and I've been, I thought Douglas would be a good choice. I mean, I'm writing a gloss on Douglas's text, The Unspeakable, in the chapter for the book, New Directions. Um, and I felt that a better approach would be more a kind of a martyrology, or martyrology by accident. In other words, people who are killed under suspicious Oops, you're fading a little bit, Eric. Oh, sorry, sorry. Wait. People who people who are assassinated politically, for in specific circumstances, which are rather dodgy, at least when you look around the edges of it, as a way of sort of investing them with a kind of a semiotic, as a kind of a possible cipher or signifier of something else that we can think about creatively, right? And that's why I said I'm also into the anti-heroic. But certain anti-heroic people who get killed in the right way become very useful for purposes of constructing a hermeneutic after the fact, whether specifically Gnostic or not. And apart from devil and demiurge, well, first of all, in terms of, I know there's, Gnosticism is just a mess, it's a concept, but there's a debate as to whether or not the Satan and the demiurge are one and the same thing. Again, there's the Valentine version, there's the Christian Gnostic version, there's the Jewish Gnostic version. So, you know, and there's Manichaeanism that crossbred with Gnosticism. So I'm not sure about demiurge or satanic. I certainly demiurgic probably impresses me more than the specifically satanic would. But I think uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, when I got my first book out, which is about Hugo Grotius and the development of international law as a way of rationalizing the Dutch colonial empire in the uh, East Indies, as Indonesia used to be known as. Uh, my sponsor was Anthony Carty, who is a professor in the um, University of Hong Kong now of international law. And he said something that just paralleled what you just said, and maybe he shouldn't have said it to me because it changed my thinking about what I was doing. He said, you're extremely good at about writing, at writing about a certain type of evil. And I hadn't really thought about that before, honestly. Because uh, I thought I was doing something vaguely Schopenhauerian, you know, like the real motors of history being the will, not the dialectic, but the anti-dialectical will, a kind of an irrational, unconscious, random, flash, you know, uh, flashing around of energies and forces, rather than anything that really can be coherently rationalized in the way that Hegel was trying to. And we now know, pretty much thanks to the work of, Pat, of McGee, that a Hegel was taking a lot of his lead from esotericism and bohemian, um, a bohemian um, heretical theology. So, so there's very much of a mystic esoteric element in, in Hegel that Schopenhauer wanted to blow up, right? Because Schopenhauer was closer to the demiurge, as I understand it. And so that kind of got me thinking about, you know, I became a little bit more self-conscious about what I was doing. And I was saying, okay, well, if I want to set a, a research project or research agenda for myself, what should it be? And it probably should be on the relationships between crime and horror. And if I'm talking about political crime and I want to complement in horror aesthetically or discursively, 
And I would probably move to something that parallels a kind of a, a very dark form of Gnosticism. When you said um, it, it's, you know, let's let's get somebody killed so we can get a hermeneutical, like, so we can get a, a good example. Is that what you meant? I mean, well, I mean, who does who does the killing? And you said to make something useful. So question one, who does the killing? Who commands the killing? And useful to whom? Okay. Well, that I can answer in the abstract because we would have to do it in an odd, on an ad hoc basis. But the second part that's implied by your question, I think I can answer by telling you a true story, which I think was one of the most idiotic things I've ever heard from another person who was a graduate student who was into conspiracy theory. He was, he was a devout believer in what we call SCADs, state crimes against democracy. And mm -hmm. SCAD is such a bullshit concept because, <laughs> because it doesn't theorize the state, it doesn't theorize crime, and it doesn't theorize democracy. Like basically anything that Thomas Paine wouldn't approve of is a crime against democracy, right? That's the bottom line. It's extremely Americanist, it's extremely folklorist, and it's a load of shit. But what we were talking about, the movie JFK on Oliver Stone. And my take on all on JFK, the film is pretty much like James Elroy's take on JFK, the film is, which is that the first half is fantastic. We, we play it over and over and over again. But once Donald Sutherland opens his mouth, you should just turn the whole thing off. Because that's when the whole thing goes off the rails. And Re I, Re Re sorry, remind remind us because I don't remember. Uh, oh, Sutherland. Donald, yeah, yeah. Donald Sutherland was Colonel X, and he meets with with um, with Kevin Costner right outside the Lincoln Memorial. They meet up in the Lincoln. He, he was proudy, right? Yeah, he's supposed to be. Yeah, basically, yeah, he's supposed to be. And um, and he, he explains the history, the, the black history of the United States for the last 500 years in that 20 minute flashback sequence, right? And I said, you know, I and I, and I said, I think Stone's big crime is that he made the wrong movie. You should have taken all that talent and done the movie adaptation of the Don DeLittle novel Libra. That would have been fantastic, which I think that's the greatest thing ever written about the Kennedy assassination. So what's that book, Eric? Uh, Libra. Okay. By Don DeLillo. Okay. And uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to summarize a Don DeLillo text, but I write about it quite a bit in both my Elroy book that's coming out and also in my uh, book uh, called... Uh, and this is the same Don DeLillo we all know, the novelist. Yeah, and the, same, the same guy we all know and love and get confused by. Yeah. Uh, on, my, on my assassination book, which is called Spectacle of the False Flag, also published by Clinton. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, that's what Stone should have done. And what he's done is he's created this fog of bullshit that's just going to confuse everybody. And the kid's answer, graduate student's answer, was basically, yeah, but he got a lot of people interested in the topic. You know, so now they're going to demand that they release the files and they're going to demand that we exhume the bodies for the 15th time. So Oswald can have 20 different autopsies performed on them and to find out if he was really him and all that stuff. And I said, that's that's going down the wrong path. So when I talk about a hermeneutic being constructed, it can either be a hermeneutic that's imposed upon the event by a kind of a, a mechanism of spectacle to make us believe something in terms of like you know, mis misinformation or deception, or conversely, someone who picks up somebody whose death should not really be mourned much, like JFK, for example, who I thought was basically a scumbag, and then turn them into a kind of a pseudo proto martyr type of figure for means of engaging in political resistance. So it's it's inherent. Every, it's it's ambiguity. It, 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 any any member of, of the sacred dead is an ambiguous figure by definition of the reasons by which he was killed, and the circumstances in which he was killed, and how that story is appropriated after the fact. Don't you think it's just a creation of fake totems to pursue something else altogether? It can be for sure. Interesting. Mm -hmm. One of your definitions, Eric, I think you got it from Peter Dale Scott, uh, of this whole what, what you call parapolitics, and yeah. you might you might you might use this moment to kind of describe your approach to parapolitics as opposed to just deep state and so forth. But I think you're quoting uh, Peter Dale Scott saying a stage managed form of universal cognitive dissonance. Yeah, you know, sure. 
Uh, parapolitics can mean a couple of different things. And there's some debate as to who actually came up with the word as well as the term criminal sovereignty. And parapolitics is a variant of wider criminal sovereignty. Um, and of course it was two of my friends, Peter Dale Scott and o Ola Tunander, and along with Robert Cribb, who more or less hammered out the defin those fundamental definitions on the book that I edited um, about parapolitics and the national security state, uh, which is a conference that we had um, in Melbourne and also Government of the Shadows as well, which was published by Pluto Press. Those mm -hmm. two books, they, they, they really more or less use that as an opportunity to define and refine their concepts and definitions. Yeah. And parapolitics, I would, I would put it this way, parapolitics is a branch, this is from my perspective, my take on it. Parapolitics is a branch of radical criminology that focuses on the largely non-reported off the books interactions between the formal state, the national security agencies, rogue off the books national security agencies and organized crime and international criminal cartels. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a nexus, it's a series of networks that jump all around, uh, coagulate, decoagulate, organize, deorganize. So it's a very chaotic, nomadic, liminal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Coupled with, and this is what I and a deep to, state, a deep state approach, just to help our listeners, would be, you know, there's this other thing that just kind of like is the puppet master over everything. You're saying no, it's this kind of like ever changing. Yeah, uh, I I don't. I had a discussion with Peter a couple of times because he started using the term deep state because he used his own version of an earlier term that goes back to the German constitutional theorist Franz Frankel called the dual state. Mm -hmm. And I like that much better. I much prefer the term dual state to deep state because the deep state's monolithic. The, the deep state is what gives conspiracy theorists a bad name because it sounds like you're talking about a secret government or a cabal or some, you know, like the Vatican is, <laughs> is really, you know, controlling Beijing, you know, it, that's not really what I think I we're talking about and certainly not what I intend to be talking about when I use the terms. So I have to kind of use deep state as a way of making a concession to the way the term has been adopted. But when I use the term deep state, my understanding is dual state in which there are parallel governmental functions and activities, many of which the state officially and honestly does not even know about, but operate subterraneously between uh, in empty spaces, passages, like Skizzy always used to like talking about and like, you know, night of day of the owl and things like that. And, um, and, and weird outcomes. How do you determine whether or not a parapolitical event is taking place? You can apply the same uh, methodology that astronomers use when trying to detect a black hole. You look at what you can observe and then if it starts wobbling or acting very strangely in and unpredictably in a way that it shouldn't, that can be taken, and again, on a case-by-case -case basis, as prima facie evidence of a parapolitical maneuver. A parapolitical force has been brought into play to sort of change the course of things that should otherwise not be the case. And, and Guido brought it up a few years, minutes ago. There is no way, looking back on it objectively, that John F. Kennedy should have beaten Richard Nixon in 1960. It's extraordinarily improbable. And yet somehow it happened, right? And we know there was cheating in, in Cook County in Illinois, and we know there was cheating in Texas. One reason why LBJ got to be the vice presidential candidate was so that he could deliver the state of Texas to the Kennedys. Think about it, John F. Kennedy beating Richard Nixon in Texas in 1960. I mean, think about it. It's it, not impossible, but very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about, you know, and as you know, in the United States today, no one can, can question electoral outcomes because that means you're an extreme white, white supremacist, misogynistic, homophobic extremist. But, and you're basically, you're like Donald Trump. But if there was ever an election that really does appear to have been stolen, it was the 1960 election. Right, right, right. I've read that many times. We just had a guest on last week. He's, he's a really interesting guy. His name is a Eugene, Dr. Eugene McCarraher from Villanova. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But he, he was fun because at the end, it, it's easy to see. We just posted a couple of days ago. He was saying, in contrast to so many of his clients, you know, just think of your average university. Uh, let's just think of, uh, you know, what constitutes today's left. He goes, you know, 
Uh, not, none of these people think there's anything even like a deep state. He goes, I know there is. I know there is. And yeah. they hated Donald Trump. You know, and this guy, again, kind of yeah. like me, is no fan of Donald Trump. But at least he kind of freed this up. Now, Guido, uh, you're seminal to today's conversation. I see you thinking down there. What do you want to say to Eric or what do you want to introduce yeah. to the conversation? I want to I ask Eric. So you mentioned dual state because I, I have big qualms about, about the deep state. But I mean, who cares what I think? I want to ask you. Um, could it be that the dual state is the first, the, the, the shallow state is theatrics and the true state is what we call the deep state. Although there might be, you know, I'm thinking of the mafia judges that got killed. Yeah. And the question, the, the, the question is this. Um, I was reading, you know, because uh, the, the period of the 70s and linked also to the attempted assassination on the Pope and all that is a very murky period mm -hmm. Period that, has been, that hasn't been explained at all. I'm trying to dig and, and try to find a thread through that. And so amongst the various books that I read, there was a, a, a double, an Italian 007 who was telling the following story. It's not directly related to anything, but the question is this. So eventually he was very close to this other guy who became the head of the anti-mafia that it was called DIA, the, uh, it was some big organ used to create a super police or a police structure created to fight the mafia, allegedly. And this guy is really ambitious and they were always, you know, they're exchanging girlfriends, always somehow promiscuously together and then being against one another. Anyway, one day, the, the the top cop asks this shady 007, he says, uh, Francesco, his last name is Pazienza. He's, he's, he's for, for all the murky story of Italy, his, na his name is notorious anyway. And he says, Francesco, please, I beg you, please tell me a place where I can go and do a blitz. Just go in there, a casino or something where I can requisition gazillions of dollars illegally stashed away and just make a, a coup, a, a, something that could be splashed on the news because I really want it. I beg you. And as if he owed him, you know? And Pacienza says, yeah, I actually know. There's this island in the Pacific, uh, which is half French, half Dutch or something like that. And in the Dutch part, they do all sorts of, funky crap just go there with your pistol arrows make your eruption in the casino and then there you go and the the top the super cup goes thank you so much we don't know how the story ends he probably went in the pacific did his arrest and it was all over the news and and you know you got a lot of press and a lot of women a lot of caviar if that's what he wanted but it came, and so this episode, which was amongst a thousand of things that Pacienza was telling, you know, other than he rode a cab with Grace Kelly and a million other funny things, fun things like that. And you would say, why did I focus on this? Because it tells you that these guys, the top SARS, cop SARS, are not hired to fight anything. They're not there to fight the mafia. They're not there to fight the, the, the eradicate the drugs. Of course, of course, they 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 can't because those things are structural. The drugs are needed. The drugs are always there. As a guy in the FBI told me, they sequester it one day and the following day, nobody knows where it is. It's going back in and everybody's taking their cuts and so on. So in the end, what are you know speaking? How does that all of this relate to the deep state? You got judges that know, and Falcone and the very famous ones, it's the same story. At those levels, these guys are not fighting the mafia. The mafia, you will never fight the mafia. You're actually fighting, you know, you're actually trying to hem the mafia in a little bit or make sure it doesn't trespass into other people's territories. But that's what you do. So in the end, what does that say about the real the system, really? You know, nobody's so what is the role of the judiciary or the judiciary into this? And does that mean that all of those that don't get killed are in a way colluded with the, the they're all corrupted? But that's not so, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of game is being played? Those who get very famous know what's up. They know that the mafia is invincible. So what do they really, what are they really doing? They're, my, my answer, but I want to ask you, is that they're playing a game that they'll never tell you what it is. But so what does that say about the structure, about the dual state, about the deep state? and about the general deceit that is politics for us in the lower strata of the me mechanized beehive in which we are. 
That's great. Uh, okay, well, there's a, that's a big salami to slice. Um, okay, I'll throw out some things. They may not be the exact sequence that you put your questions or comments in, but it's some things will, will kind of stick, I guess, as I as I toss them out. Um, Ernst Frankel, whose model of the dual state, not the deep state, but the dual state that I follow, was a constitutional German, uh, uh, German constitutional theorist in the late 20s and early 30s, about the same time as Carl Schmitt was. And his central principle- what's, Sorry, what's the name again? Ernst Frankel, F-R-A-N- Oh, Frankel. Yeah, yeah, Ernst, yeah, Frankel, yeah. Because you you read the the, the MS of my book, uh, you know, The View from Howard's Footpad. So I've yes. got like a half a chapter on Frankel. Right, uh, right. Talking about the mafia, actually. That's where I, I my mafia discussion takes place in that. And um, his take is, is that, and this gets us back to the game that's being played, or as I would call it, the spectacle that's being generated, like a, a film projection following Du Bois, right? Uh, the society of the spectacle revisited or thought out with more examples, basically. And uh, Frankl's position is, is that every state has a reason of state, raison d'etre, raison d'etat function that it cannot explain to itself within both its own theoretical assumptions and its own public relations to its own governed populace. And that's the relationship between internal domestic policy and foreign affairs. That's a weak link in the constitutional coherence of any state. Okay, keep speaking mm -hmm. down into the- uh... oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That is the, that is the weak link in, in, in any constitutional system of any state. How do you actually manage, negotiate, and govern the intrinsic contradictions between your domestic policy and your foreign policy, right? England abolishes slavery within Britain, but it creates a system of massive peonage in India, which is a colony, simultaneously. How do you reconcile these contradictions? And his answer, which I think is a good one to run with and play with and see what he can do with it, is that a state will kind of disassociate from itself and it will create a clandestine body of 50, 100, 200 people who are specialists in foreign and military affairs, and they will then proceed to act in a clandestine or covert manner, right? The United States is a democracy, but it has foreign policy interests to maintain anti-democratic regimes abroad. How does it reconcile the contradiction, right? Including to its own people. What it does is it does things like, um, uh, what Oliver North did with the Contras in Nicaragua or clandestine funding to death squads in El Salvador. And you need an outfit. It can ship, shape shift. It can be different people at different times. It can be full-timers, part-timers, hiring people by proxy, hiring people on a contract basis, including the mafia who are running weapons all throughout the Caribbean, not just against Castro and Cuba, but throughout the entire Caribbean it began mutating with Johnson called the Murder Incorporated that John Kennedy had set up, actually Robert Kennedy had set up in the Caribbean during the early 60s. Um, that's what we mean by the dual state. And the thing about the dual state is that whatever, and like you said, not every major judge in Italy is corrupt, even though they may not be selected for assassination by the mafia, because literally not everybody could be that corrupt all the time that you're looking at something that's almost statistically impossible, although there may be grades or degrees of corruption throughout the entire state. The dual state, not the deep state, but the dual state will also eventually start acquiring over time an element of what we would call criminal sovereignty. In other words, a sub-statist thing that in terms of its operational effects is tantamount to a sovereign power. And then they isn't, and ladies and gentlemen, I, well, well, I want to welcome people looking at YouTube. Our, our co-host, Michael Martin, jumped in. Michael, I was starting to think you had something against uh, Guido Preparata because it would have been three in a row. It no, been... no, I have something against my, 
my cow starving. <laughs> That's not, that was my conjecture. So, you, yeah. you know, you saw, Mike, uh, we're talking at a very, very high level here about distinctions. <laughs> to have Guido interviewing Eric is, is a tour de force. So uh, we'll both listen in again. Guido, uh, keep on digging. No, no, on I, 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 I'm sorry if I interrupted a, a train of thought. I was, I was asking Eric, but don't you think that all of this talk of criminal sovereignty, which, which I like because the expression is cool, is, is ultimately due to the fact that they are that the vast majority of, of, of the world lives in in subhuman conditions right mm -hmm. and, and and so that you need to when the exploitation is such uh, crime and 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 the narcotization of, of the masses are are obligatory mm -hmm. so so what can a judge do you know he says well he or she is fighting the mafia. No, they're not. Uh, I, I'm fighting against drugs. No, you're you're not. So what is that? Is just to make sure it doesn't. It, it is not a tidal wave of drugs. Is it just to keep it under control? Because and half of this and half of that, the shallow state after that, is hmm. spectacle. So, right. but is it is it is it this way? Uh, it can be that way. I, I, let me. I, let me try to narrow it down a little bit and use a, a, a counterfactual to a hypothetical you threw out. That you said straight out, and I'm glad somebody finally said it, not me, uh, that the mafia is indestructible, right? You cannot, you may can do individual things and take down a particular guy under who knows what circumstances, right? But you can't really dismantle the system. And the reason why you can't really dismantle the mafia is the mafia just isn't the mafia. The mafia, I mean, I am speaking on an extreme high level of abstraction here, but it's kind of Sicilian social consciousness quasi-institutionalized, right? I mean, it's a mentalité. It's a paradigm. It's a gestalt. It's a belt and schauung. It's, it's all, I'm German, by the way, not Italian. All, all, all the all these shows, right? It all these things, um, and to kill the mafia off. If we're talking talking about like an enemy, an external thing that corrupts the state from the outside, and we're trying to kill it like a vampire, and you know, fighting a vampire is a great way of thinking about the mafia. The imagery actually comes up once in a while. Drive a stake through the mafia's heart. You can't do it because it's an embodiment of social consciousness. It's a cultural phenomenon. How do you kill off a cultural phenomenon? And you can't. And one reason why you can't is that the persecutors of the monster are themselves spawned by the same thing that spawned the monster, because it's it's part of a continuum of mentality. Well, I like um, that. It's great. So, what are they doing then? What it, what is, you know, if you want to take a, an existential or a, a surreal moment, is the life of a judge. What is the life of a judge? Is it is it like a deceit within a deceit? I mean, uh, how far can you push this? Hmm. That well, that's a little vague. I, I mean, I'm trying to narrow down to something a bit more particular. Uh, I mean, we can say we can just recycle De Boer and say this is just spectacle. A democracy to be a democracy, to maintain the pretense of democracy and virtual reality. Oops. Microphone a little bit. Again. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. A democracy is a democracy to maintain the pretense of democracy has to be seen visually in terms of almost like movie or documentary like fashion to be fighting the anti democratic forces that it itself is simply one part of a continuum of a larger thing. Uh, there's that. I mean, but that, that again, that is, that may be true, defensible up to a point. But it, it lacks specificity. I mean, it doesn't necessarily help us out in any particular circumstance. So the moment the moment you are inducted as a judge, so either you become a famous judge and you're a full time actor, or you're just there for petty claims or small claims. You're just there to fight oh. the little guys, and that's when you apply the code, right? But that's it. Well, that's definitely part of it for sure. But um, let me ask you another question. Let me ask you a question then. Did Fal Do you think Falcone, Giovanni Falcone? actually knew what he was doing nobody knows what he was doing do i, I uh, think that he knew well, let, me, let me rephrase it okay then. describe this background a little bit falcone a name probably not known to 95 oh, I'll, I'll let guido do that he knows way more 
Well, no, I don't know anymore. Yeah, Falcone is like a national hero. It's him and his, his colleague, uh, who Borsellino, they're two most famous judges and they're martyrs. There we go. We're getting to the, in Eric's, um, Eric's um, portrayal. And, um, sorry. And uh, yeah, Falcone, uh, Falcone is, is, is the most famous uh, anti-mafia judge. He is remembered for, for being the superstar. I would say the main actor and director of what's called, it was, was known as the Maxi Trial of the Mafia in mid eighties. And after that it was dismantled, but it was a spectacle nevertheless, where they were with the state you know, was known for being, for, for having pushed back the mafia and it seemed things were going well. And after that it was dismantled and he was, the story gets really murky. Uh, he is, um, he was, uh, he was uh, antagonized. He wanted to be the head of, I guess, that big anti-mafia body I was talking about that was taken over by that other guy I was mentioning, maybe before the friend of the 007. And eventually, as the uh, eventually he came to work, he went to Rome under the auspices of the Socialist Party, who also in those days was particularly uh, voted by the mafia in Sicily, it was known, to uh, be some kind of a super... Uh, anti-mafia uh, cop working within the Ministry of Justice in the early 90s under the uh, direction of Prime Minister of Andreotti, who's one of the most Catholic, you know, just a, a dignitary of the Christian Democrats, very close to the Vatican, whom everybody accused of being very close to the mafia. Again, all sorts of weirdness here. And uh, and he was uh, he was killed in 92 with the with, uh, explosion there's a bombing attempt in sicily it was it was catastrophic and his wife died and all the all the bodyguards and 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 a month later they killed his is i wouldn't say second in command it was his alter ego another sicilian judge by the name of borsellino with another explosion in the heart of in the heart of um of, of palermo and that was linked to the weird transition from the old system to the new system when berlusconi took over anyway it's a long story so Eric was saying, do you do I think that Falcone knew what he was doing? My answer is yes. I think he, he was doing something, but I don't know what it was. And it's all cryptic and it's it's a deep mystery. And we have all these declarations that he made that he met Bush Sr. at the Roman embassy in 1990 and then said he regretted doing that. And nobody knows what he meant. So it's a it's a thick mystery. But I guess Eric uh, overcomes all that and sees it on a higher plane of those routines I was talking about mm -hmm. uh, that are demurgically paid, played out. You obviously don't think that Falcone knew that he was caught in his own surreal routine. I'm uncertain. That's why I was asking. I can see it go both ways. I think another thing too, yeah. uh, sorry, I yeah. see it both ways. Again, it's, it's ambiguity, right? Ambiguity seems to be the best Ambiguity and irony are basically the two best mental. We're still struggling with the audio a little bit. Oh, here. sure. Is this yeah. better? It is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. I, I know it looks a little bit odd. But it's the only way That's I can. That's fine. Do it. That's fine. It's okay. Uh, I think ambiguity and irony are probably the two best instruments and a researcher, a parapolitical researcher, can have to kind of like dissect or at least photograph the phenomena that they're looking at, which in many ways is in fact unnameable because if something's highly liminal, it crosses borders and boundaries. And that means it starts becoming ontologically and epistemologically kind of like shapeless and formless. So you're not sure, but you follow networks, you follow pathways, you follow connections. Peter Dale Scott made a career out of figuring out who went to whose dinner parties. Because if he could, so if he could establish a social network of some kind, then he's got the communication channels that would be necessary for political par parapolitical phenomena to, to take place. I mean, you know, if George Morshenschelt knew uh, David Atlee Phillips, that gave Phillips a connection to Oswald because Morshenschelt out comes out of nowhere and becomes a patron of Lee Harvey Oswald in the months prior to the assassination. That doesn't prove that David Lee, David Atlee Phillips, or Maurice Bishop, as he's known, was part of the conspiracy, but it removes an objection, removes optical plausibility or implausibility. Mm -hmm. The thing starts becoming a little less implausible if you can figure out who actually knows each other and the degree to which they interact. So there's a network analysis. I also think too, and I've been thinking about this more recently, there's also the element to, to take a tool 
uh, to take one of the things in the anthropological toolkit is ritual. Why do states behave this way? Well, one reason why states behave this way is that if we look at what the international legal, de legal definition of a state is, it's an entity that behaves in a particular way. And that means to be legitimate, meaning being recognized by other states as being a state, meaning being in the game of stateness, of statehood, which is a prestige thing. It's a profit thing. Uh, banks like investing in your government or in poor investors like showing up, if you're deemed to be a law abiding state, means a ritual of at least engaging in the game of persecuting and prosecuting uh, organized criminality and corruption. It's not necessarily sinister. There, 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 there be a, there, I think there's a real mercenary profit element uh, as an underappreciated factor in the spectacle of, of waging war against organized crime. Michael Martin, you know, so that's a, that's a lot. You know, Greedo sitting back in his chair. He's, uh, what do you hear in Michael and kind of like get <clears throat> into that or, you know, any, any vector you take us on, we'll kind of circle back to these things too. Um, well, from, from what I'm hearing, um, and you, I, you're kind of focusing on Italy, but I'm, I immediately go to the United States when I, when I think about this stuff. So, um, you, know, you mentioned the dual state or, you know, in, and we talk a lot in this country about the deep state, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so who's running things? So is it this, and it's almost like what you just, what, what, the way you describe it, it almost sounds like something from, uh, occult literature and i mean like literary literature not mm. the writings where there's this kind of demon or something and sometimes it shows up here and sometimes it shows up there and you can never really nail it down because it's from a different dimension right it seems that's what it sounds like you're describing but 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 who's behind all of this i'm not sure that there the, the question presupposes the possibility of the existence of an essence what, what I would call, what Nicholas Passos is also one of my sponsors would call a criminal, criminogenic substance. I'm not sure there is one. I think we're looking at a radical form of phenomenalism or phenomenality. Mm -hmm. I think it's different things acting in different ways, interacting at different levels at different times, at different rates of velocity, tempo, and acceleration. But here's the thing, though. and I don't want to sound like like a sophomoric bullshitter, but I mean, <laughs> I, 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 it, we're, we're looking be... at, well, I am a sophomoric bullshitter, but we are looking at lots of different interacting parts, each of which kind of has to be understood as a thing well, that sometimes converge to produce certain outcomes that we say are evil. But here's here's the thing, though. It seems to me, and I we don't talk about this before, that there's there's an intelligence behind it. Or even a consciousness, because it has a kind of. Um, and this might tie in, Eric. Michael, uh, 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 Eric mentioned kind of a recent conversion to orthodoxy too. And oh, by the way, point, my orthodox name is Michael. Oh wow! So oh, we well got done. three Mikes. Well, well done, done indeed. Michael is my middle name, and I just recycled my Catholic saint's name as an orthodox name. Yeah, I'm going to kick Guido off right now until he gets with the program. I don't yeah, know that's right. Yeah. Well, we're going to try to confuse everybody. We're only going to have people named Michael on the show. <laughs> Can I, can I say something? I, I think I think that, um, I don't know, uh, Eric, uh, in a theosophist would completely relate to what you're saying and, and, and say that you're just speaking about, uh, you know, uh, demonic archangels, basically. Uh, archons. Archons, yeah. Sure. But that, that, that's essentially, it could be translated into that, couldn't it? It could be. Uh, but these are, are archons that have only a temporary existence. Uh, I think a good word, one, a book I, I'm, it's been in the works forever, and it's on, a, on the relationship between surrealism, surrealistic art, surrealistic aesthetics, and serial murder. Okay. And the thing is like 10,000 pages long, and all the notes are there. So I'm going to have to sort it out at some point before I expire, I hope. But um, one of the things I came across was a fascinating idea by Alfred Jarre, 
uh, one of the important guys, very early surrealist, and this links to late decadence and symbolism. And he came up with the term, what he called pataphysics. <coughs> and pataphysics is a bogus science. It's a pretend science that, that studies phenomena that only exist part of the time. I mean, it's about real things that occur spontaneously, run kind of like UFOs or Bigfoot sightings. They come out of nowhere, they run around, they leave traces, and then they vanish. But I mean, they literally vanish. They don't hide somewhere else. They dematerialize, right? And that's what he called pataphysics. Right. And I think that may be one of the most brilliant, insane ideas I've ever heard because Pataphysical does seem to be sort of kind of a good descriptor of what we're talking about when we talk about deep state, dual state, neuropolitical, criminogenic things. We're looking at temporary materializations of phenomena of a very limited or finite temporal or spatial dimensions. Okay, Reno, you know, your head must be weirder? busting. Or go ahead, Michael. Yeah. I want to get a little, a little weirder. So um, I have, don't really pay attention. My wife is talking to me about it in, intermittently, but if you're probably familiar with, the, with what they say about the MK Ultra program, right, mm -hmm. where they were training kids to do kind of remote viewing and stuff like this, right? Um, which to me, he's, you know, it seems to fit into what you're describing, mm -hmm. where because it's like you said, it's. You know, it's you, pataphysical. Is that what you say? Pataphysics, yeah. Yeah, pataphysical. So it it would seem to be what 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 you're describing is kind of uh, congruent with what, what that yeah. program was, was doing with with trying to you know to trying to train kids. You know, because if you know, I I grew up in in the I was born in 1962, so I was about 15 or so when when the Rubik's cube came out. Oh yeah. And kids by my age, we you couldn't do it, but yeah. these little kids would just go, oh, and you're like, wow, that's just bizarre. Um, but little kids could do it, and and it's the same kind of thing that MK Ultra was, or at least that they, that that's what's reported. They were trying to do with, with children at the mm -hmm. same time. But what you're describing with, and this is what why I was asking using the word. There seems to be an intelligence or a consciousness behind these kinds of. I, I wouldn't call them. Into, uh, these kinds of uh, cultural movements that we see, or, or, or political movements, I would say, that seem to infiltrate, or it's almost like a poison or something that gets in there, right? But it's it's a it's a poison with with kind of consciousness. It seems to me. Uh, I referenced before. I think it's before you you managed to cure your cow. It was, I hope <laughs> it was. We were talking about Don a little novel called Libra which is his novel. It's right. half, a, a half a biography of Lee Harvey Oswald. And it's half a biography about what may have happened in Dallas in, on, in 1963, 20, November 22, 63. And, and James Elroy, my, my recent book is coming out on, is about this. And he loved Lilo. Uh, he loved Libra. And that's why he wrote the USA Underworld Trilogy. Uh, it's sort of his response to, to DeLillo's novel, Libra. And what DeLillo lays out is something a little that kind of is pataphysical, which is that it starts off with three CIA guys. One's a mercenary weapons guy. One is bas basically the leader of the outfit. Of this, this private group of three guys is, uh, oh, God, I'm, the name has slipped me, but it was the guy who was head of the CIA operations who was fired by Kennedy after Bay of Pigs as a scapegoat. Dulles. No, not no, not Dallas. It was somebody else. It was somebody director of operations. It, 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 name will uh, name will come back in five minutes or so. But him and basically a, a kind of an intermediate, very gray, very dual state CIA and state, and they get together and said, let's basically mock an attempted assassination. If the shooter misses, oops, your 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 vote. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let, let's let's simulate a fake assassination attempt on Kennedy. The shooter misses, he's killed, and he's got a ton of, of, of Cuban and Che Guevara and Castro literature in his apartment. 
and we'll frame Cuba, we'll frame Castro for it, and we get to invade Cuba. That's the false flag, right? You attack yourself and make it look like somebody else did it so you can start a war. That's a real dual state operation because remember, dual state is about negotiating by clandestine means contradictions between foreign and domestic policy, right? Yep. We got to get Cuba back. Partly the mafia owns it. The mafia is part of the dual state, but we can't say it on public, so we have to fabricate a crisis, right? And that's and that's a classic dual state scenario. But where pataphysics comes into it is as they begin plotting the thing, it starts acquiring its own momentum. In other words, the the, the conspiracy starts thinking itself. Mm -hmm. And what starts out as let's make sure the shooter misses evolves. Like it, it starts acquiring its own deviant consciousness and says, <laughs> no, we've got to hit him. It's the, a kind of AI. You what say, do you yeah, think about it, this? It is, it is. Yeah. It, it's yeah. kind of like a naturally occurring AI. Mm -hmm. That uh, that achieves. I'm, I'm using Jerry's term. It's not my term. It's Jerry's term. But I'm, I'm you trying to establish an, an analogy here that it's pataphysical. It's a real thing that's intangible, but only exists for a short period of time. They, they've brought in, and you can use a union term, which is much abused, the collective unconscious or synchronicity. And it's, by the way, it's the greatest novel about synchronicity ever written, Libra. Okay, <laughs> because it's sort of there's also a very good. I mean, it's it's insanity basically, but it's two volumes edited by a guy called Alberti called High Strangeness and the JFK Assassination, and it's about the possibility of synchronicity working through through these, these, these parapolitical, pataphysical things, that something seemed to be initiated that acquired its own momentum and acquired its own, a kind of, a, a, of a, an incipient consciousness, meaning that the human... The meaning that the human actors involved in this off the books thing began realizing their unconscious meanings. If we, if you start off by saying, let's simulate an, a failed attempted assassination on the president to start a war with Cuba so we can invade it, what is buried in that premise that if it's allowed to run over time, will spontaneously emerge and then become the new controlling thought yeah. of the operation kill the president so yeah so so saint paul was right when he said our contention is not with flesh and blood right possibly yeah, yeah. i don't know it's demonic but it's certainly pataphysical in some way Rito, go what are you hearing it's as, uh, to me, it, it's as if uh, Eric were describing the uh, average day of a Hindu demon who, who is like playing with, with Maya, you know, tricks of the light, and is just experimenting like on Photoshop, right? And he's going to try one thing and another and see what emerges from the canvas. And, and that, that's great. And, but the question then, what about us? I mean, we're we're not we're not on board with this we're not or as Junger would say although i doubt he was being uh, tongue-in-cheek we're not equal to this level to this criminogenic uh, filth who's who's thinking us and what is our game because we don't like this we're just trying there to figure it out but you know if it's all a demurgical game what are we just uh you know side draws just a pack of googly eyes how do we factor in? How do we factor into this story? Okay, well, I'll throw out a new term. Epiphenomenal. We know epiphenomenal. Yeah. We are epiphenomenal. Also, we don't count for oh, shit, basically. Let me put it this way. I think maybe what is behind all of this, the you know, the the you know, the you know, don't you know, don't look at the man behind the curtain moment, right? The main thing ab about it, and we're all making this mistake, and this gets us back to kind of Gnosticism. So you may be a Gnostic Guido, and I may be a, a theo theosophist, okay? But I think what it takes us back to is we may have made a, a collective category mistake. We have mistaken the state as the phenomena and its criminal its parapolitical deviancies as the epiphenomenal, and in fact, the relationship is reversed that every state historically emerges out of a series of arrangements and rituals and procedures that 
precede the state because they have to anthropologically. You know, you, you don't get to the state out of nothing. You don't, you never have a Hobbesian moment of everyone comes out of the jungle and decides to form a social contract and everything proceeds from that. If there's a contractual moment and it's a very useful myth, I mean, lawyers love it because it has a tremendous pragmatic value, the, the social contract myth. The social contract depends upon a whole series of relationships that are pre-contractual. -contract, pre right. And if they're pre-contractual, what are they? If they can be designated as anything. And the thing, it's really personal, private, subjective, sexual, gender, uh, tribal, well, even, not even religious, because you can't have a religion without a state, right? But I mean, supernatural, occultic, whatever, there's a whole plurality of different types of social and cultural and emotional and emotive and aff affective relationships that people have with each other before they enter into proper formal legal relationships. So you're saying you're saying that we we are everything is kind of a every uh, you're saying that everything is spawned by a variety of waves, right? And that's uh, you know like waves in 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 a vacuum, and 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 they and they collide, and things happen. And so it's 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 kind of a it's it's just waves. It's the mystery. Of, it's a jungle of waves that kind of issues it all. I for waves, I would say forces. Yeah, but it's approximately the same thought. What did David Hume <laughs> say in his uh, on the original contract? Wasn't he kind of doing the same thing there, Eric? You know, just bit, reminding yes. us, reminding yeah. us that this notion of uh, the original contract was, you know, it's just a useful heuristic to try and like throw yeah. some mythological underpinnings on something. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and we just again the whole world came out as a as a hurly burly and we've kind of shifted it this way and that. Yeah. Um, and if if hurly burly, okay, I'll put it to you this way. Hurly burly into the microphone. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. If hurly burly is really the the substance meaning of things, meaning that which precedes everything else, from which everything else flows, then the state can be nothing else other than epiphenomenal because it's a byproduct of a series of processes which are non-statist. For some see, reason, this strikes me as almost so obvious, you know, that we do, you know, I just, you know, in an individual's life, I'm yeah. constantly reminding young people that like, you know, um, I've written a lot on like Archimedes, you know, just that like yeah. we're born, we come out of our mom's womb and we're surfing, right? That's the image. We just have to start figuring things out. But we have people like Archimedes that we start to, in an, in an uncontrollable world, we start to envision control. So we posit these, these positions where we can use levers and, and pulleys to start getting control of this. But really the primal thing is surfing. You know, sailing was a big thing for the theologian Ramon Argardini, yeah. you know. And, um, and so I don't want to posit this, that like what you're saying is axiomatically true, Eric, but I find it, I, it resonates that we need to start exploring this way because uh, in an individual life, when we think all of a sudden there was a time at which we got total control of over everything, that's a myth. And I see in the individual life, it hurts somebody's maturation, right? Because you you go to that myth, you go to that your secret place, um, hiding in a cavern, and you start looking at the world from the bottom where we need more myths or we need more anthropologies that hmm. see us essentially as coming out of our mom's womb sailing. You know, yeah. this was a... Rabelais was the great, I think, novelist of this phenomenon. Yeah, and also, uh, if you're in parapolitics, can't hear you. Uh, sorry, if you're interested in parapolitics, we talked about Libra by Don DeLillo, but I would also recommend, not because it's parapolitical, but because it gets you into a parapolitical researching frame of mind, is, is the great book by Milan Kundera, uh, The Unbearable Likeness of Being. Because what he proves is that there's no such thing as free will really, is at any given moment, we are simply the byproduct of thousands of variables that we have no control over whatsoever, nor are we even really conscious. Of. I mean, I mean, where is this? What is this foundational thing that we're supposed to achieve that gives us the basis from which to conceive at least a transparent and self auto corrective and self legitimizing political system? Mm -hmm. Because there are all kinds of non-political variables, forces, waves. If you really want to come up with a big concept, you just call it Schopenhauer's will. 
Ridley, which is about the most anti-Hegelian thing you can think of, which is why he thought it, because he hated Hegel's guts, <laughs> uh, to, to, to account for all of this. And that's why politics is not its own thing. It's a byproduct of forces that are non anti inherently non-political or apolitical. And if we oh, we're still struggling. We'll struggle a little bit. Sure, 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 sure. And if we admit, if we admit to the reality, how do we know that we've expurgated them? How do we know that we've transcended them? But how do we know we've overcome them? Or do they still haunt us? Are we still embedded within them? So what you're describing, it sounds like a Gnostic universe to me. So what's the way out, right? Why does there? Why does there have to be a way out? Why does there have to be a way out? Is that I'd like one. <laughs> okay. Well, if you really want to get down to brass tacks, we all know that. And by the way, today's my wife's birthday, and yesterday was my birthday, so I guess it's appropriate to think of these thoughts. There is one guaranteed way out. Do you really want me to say it? Yes. Suicide. Uh -huh. Okay. That's no. I don't want you to say it. But okay. Can you edit no, that I, out? I, I don't want to be blamed for anyone shooting themselves. No. 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 Right. 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 After no, this podcast, no, no, no. we went from orthodoxy to stoicism, like that. But, yeah. uh, okay, stoicism then. Uh, cultivated apathy, coupled with a strong sense of cynicism and irony. Right. Mm -hmm. But so now it is time to go into it, Eric. <laughs> your your notion of your recent conversion. You know, yeah. some of this thinking. You know, how would you tell that story? And then, you know, um, you pick this apart when he says it, you know, go ahead. Okay, I'll put it give in about 50 words or less. Um, and I'm going to, well, there are many reasons why, but linking it to what we've been talking about, what I found a, more and more attractive about orthodoxy rather than, than Latin Catholicism, because it's governed by the Thomistic rationalist approach, is the emphasis, the centrality upon apophatic theology, mm -hmm. that it's really about direct, it, cultivating a certain type of mysticism is mainstream in orthodox practice, and spiritual practice, liturgy, and theology. Okay. And I began thinking more and more that if there is a way out other than the vulgar one of just switching off, either partially or permanently, uh, it is the only the other hope that we've got is of the ability to cultivate some kind of immediate intuitive apperception, apperception. But the problem with that is even if you hit the truth, you can never prove that you've got it because the proof will be inexpressible in terms of the, the conventional language of common sense reality. That's my take. Okay. I mean, there are and other reasons think, too. But. In, in, but in your conversion too, you know, I'm trying to put myself, because I said I'm very sympathetic to this notion that we, you know, you you grab the words hurly-burly. You know, and I, yeah. I think a lot of my writings, I use hurly-burly as much as anything. It sounds kind of Irish. Irish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, um, you know, in I'd have to think about it for myself too, how I, because it would be taking God's name in vain. Mm -hmm. But there's this notion, you know, that, um, again, we go back to theosophy a little bit. But at a certain point in time, you get this notion. So in um, in a simplistic way, they say, like, upon this rock, I stand, you know, Jesus on this rock, mm -hmm. that um, that the bedrock is a relationship, right? You know, mm -hmm. this thing in the hurly burly, um, you know, I think if theologians were exploring from the hurly burly, you do get you get the primacy of the human person. And then you get to me, I'm just thinking out loud, you get to like Florensky's chapters on friendship again, mm -hmm. right? Um, something about this, the real anthropological unit, we were talking, the anthropological unit as opposed to self-seeking maximal, you know, utility maximizing things, this kind of monad. I think we get freed from that. We call out the duplicity of the church in using that anthropology in certain places. But I, I think somehow the, 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 the future anthropology of the church is it's something like a dyad it's friends you know um yeah. you know and this that's get it gets into a you know it's too far afield but <clears throat> i i think we can i just know i feel good in my gut reminding people that we we enter a world of flux but mm -hmm. we uh, and i get your point about apophatic theology but um you know my my new thing on this um this podcast we don't eric is that and i'm thinking of a lot of what michael and i call 
Uh, they're younger than you, Eric, but ortho bros, right? And uh, there's a phenomenon yeah, online yeah. where everybody's collecting all their esoteric stuff. And a lot of it's there in orthodoxy. You can reference the fathers, you reference mm -hmm. like um, theosis and this and that. And the esoteric is now exoteric, but the exoteric, which is friendship. None of these guys know how to make friends. You know, it's just an observation I've made. And this gets into my- They're, they're kind of professional virgins, aren't they? Yes, in one sense, right. But um, there's something that the, the real <laughs> esotericism of our time is like friendship, friendship, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's, uh, you know, we, we we let go of our life rafts in a sense, we swim out into the deep, and the anthropological unit in the deep is a dyad, you know, this is some of the language that's coming to me. I, I think whether we talk about orthodoxy in particular or, or Catholicism, and, and and I just one reason is I just became very very disappointed with the rationalist Thomistic culture too. Oh sure. So, oh, so Augustine, 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 I love and hate Aquinas. I just I can't digest it anymore. Yeah. But yeah. the thing is, is that I, I think the big if because I know we're kind of coming to the end, I guess. Sure. But the big takeaway from this, from criminology, conspiracy theory, parapolitics, theology, all these things we've been talking about, I think I've kind of come, it, it's it's a step forward, it's a help, it's not the answer, but I think we have to start thinking anthropologically about these phenomena much more. Totally. I mean, if you bring in ritual, network, kinship, affiliation, affectivity, I think these things, none of this will be of an explanation, but I think it's a better way. Well, about, it's a better way of going about framing questions and answers, in which at least we may be able to 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 phase out some of the noise and focus on on signals better. I, I again, 100 percent agree, and I've written about this a lot lately to say, like, when people want to say that um, the next Christian Christendom is going to you know have to do with Dostoevsky, the simple apologetics tack is because Dostoevsky was all 100% about anthropology. Yes. Anthropology. Yep. Anthropology. I agree. And, 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 and by the way, which church did he belong to? He belonged to the Russian Orthodox Church. Orthodox Church. Thank you. <laughs> Michael and I could have a field, not a field day, but we want to engage that another time. That's that we had a choice. But I just have a thing against proscenium arches, um, uh, iconostasis and altar rails, and this whole idea of submitting mm -hmm. ourselves in front of this hocus pocus. It's a disease I call religion and Jesus came to cure it. And I see a lot of people like once the hurly burly gets pretty intense, like we had Paul Kingsnorth on, if you know that name, a great mm -hmm. environmental crusader. Great. You know, and he, he could call out the distinctions between, you know, when he was just fighting to save trees to all of a sudden, like it became so abstract, like climate change. But I think it got pretty stressful. And all of a sudden, he just laid it down in front of the iconostasis. And I'm, you know, I work for the Catholic Church, and I'm crying foul on a lot of that stuff. You know, let's <laughs> let's stay. Let's stay with the anthropology. Let's figure this stuff out, like no, human no. faces and friendship. Yep. But, but I think, Eric, what you're describing is, is an antidote to the, this machine or whatever you want to call it is uh, a word. We, I don't think we've used this word on the podcast, but it should be obvious, the, the communion of saints, right? Because which is which is both physical and spiritual at the same time, right? Um, so and maybe and maybe you know what we, we're you're kind of pushing me to reconsider uh, the early church and, uh, and its its political position, though it wasn't a political position in the world. Uh, and, and also in, in relationship to Gnosticism, because I think. Mm -hmm. The Gnostics were much more awake to the political reality around them than you find in early Christianity, which is more emphasized on the ecclesia, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, but I think, uh, what comes out of bo what both of them, in a way, is is that idea of the, of the communion of saints, which which means we were talking about, you know, the these uh these these phenomena that kind of blurb up and do a little evil disappear again come up in a different form over here mm -hmm. uh which is a spiritual phenomena right and so i'm thinking um and you talked about mysticism as a way to uh short circuit the the rationalist frame that we have right now which actually goes back to the nominalists and thomists right yeah I read about that in the submerged reality of the first chapter is all about that, about, you know, how, how we got everything wrong from the beginning using a left brain theology. Yeah. Um, 
so it's just interesting to me to, you know to see you know <laughs> since since i don't want to commit suicide <laughs> what are my alternatives right Guido, what are you hearing here no no good i was just uh I was enthralled i was thinking about the waves i don't know just uh loving uh loving uh hearing the exchange I I I I wrote it down. Apophatic. I, I have to look it up. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the notion, Guido. That's the notion that uh, you can only get so far by saying God is this, is that. You know, and then you have to go. You have to flip the script and go in the inversion of that to say it's more accurate to say God is not love, because all those things you're leaving out, even when you say God is love. So this is the um, this is the approach of the mystics generally, the apophatic theology, as opposed to cataphatic. Yeah. For negative theology, you can also call this. Okay, uh, how about this then? And, and Into the and, microphone again. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. How about this then? And this is kind of like another Zen cone sort of thing. A uh, very good John Huston movie called The Asphalt Jungle, which is about uh, a jewel heist that goes hideously wrong and everyone wipe, ends up wiping each other out. But in the line, near the end of the film, the um, crooked lawyer, Mr. Emmerich, uh, in tone tells is having a conversation with his mistress who was like Marilyn Monroe in her first film right so you can't miss this one so he's talking to Marilyn Monroe his mistress, and he's talking about the division between law and crime and he says well after all crime is nothing more than a left-handed form of human endeavor you know. a left-handed form of human endeavor uh, and that's it. That's all it is. The, the laws, the prohibitions, the transgressions, the punishments, that all comes after the fact. It's simply a particular way, form of human behavior and cannot be reduced to anything else other than that. And the abstract, from the contextual, anything can go, right? Any particular circumstance. But it really is simply a way, a pattern of one way of being human. Because why can criminal, why can animals not commit crimes? They cannot commit crimes because they cannot formulate a criminal intent. Mm -hmm. Only we can do that, as far as we know. And okay, well, I have to see. I have to see the movie or see it again, because it's about stealing money, right? Yeah. Which is the yeah. Okay, we can make. Well, it's a survival issue, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I, know. I have to think. That's good. It's good. I like it. How about we do this again sometime? I, I yeah. like this, you know, but the, uh, this was probably, this is probably the, not out of the box. It would just, for our, for our listeners, you know, they're going to, they're going to be able to follow some things, not follow others, myself included, but this is, um, you know, I want to kind of encapsulate this for our listeners too, is that, um, you know, the, uh, I always reference the first chapter of Genesis, just the, where are you question as being so important and we drop off that question so much and that um that you know so we're going to quote guido who says we've mentioned it many times you know conspiracy theory is too important to be left to conspiracy theorists uh, we've invited eric guido did on the show because um a lot of people we just want to know you know uh the word deep state can just become another form of religion right it's just yeah. um it's a it's a slogan throw throw out there i also or, remind or, or, people that yeah fetish even fetishism yeah, fetish, right. yeah. but then when when all of a sudden we have this whole notion that like conspiracy is the goofiest thing then you get this you know this really hypertrophied version of wig history you know that just things get better and nobody ever met in a room not even once and decided something that was bad for other people in the aggregate you know and so for the regeneration podcast we're just we're certainly not against trying to figure out like you know what the hell is going on um and that includes a critique of normal ways people see you know, the Whig version of history, but it also includes um, an honest critique like we're doing here of a certain form of conspiracy theory. Um, and we're, we're trying to break this down very seriously. You were going to say something, Eric. Well, if anyone ever throws out the, the challenge, I, and I think, I forget who it was, I think it was, um, oh, never mind, I'll remember it later, but it was one of these Whig type of historians. Oh, I think it was Richard Pipes who threw out the challenge on, on this, this public debate once they were having about conspiracy and he says to the guy, the journalist, yes, yeah. the, the muckraking journalist, prove, show me one example of a conspiracy. I challenge you. Prove me. Give me an example. And the guy came up with a rather weak example. So I would simply say this. You're ever in this situation? Just say one word. And it's one of Guido's favorite words. Mafia. Yeah. The mafia is nothing but, but 
uh, a conspiracy machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Organized crime is conspiratorial in essence. Absolutely. And it, need, it needs politics and the cops working for it on some level in some ways for it to work in the way that it is. But even then, of course, that's embedded within wider social network systems. But one, one, one could have told that that arrogant asshead of pipes that... One <laughs> I didn't yeah, say well, that, you know, in case like his kids are listening. Did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I do that. Pretty much everything is conspiracy, and almost nothing is not conspiracy. Every decision is never made in a democratic fashion. As you remember, any kind. I remember even in faculty meetings, uh, they were observing confidentiality rules, even for ordering toilet paper or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> even that is conspiratorial on an administrative level. But, but I, I love that in Oxford, against apparently a genius mathematician has proven that conspiracy theory cannot possibly, a theorem cannot possibly exist because, you know, it's impossible. It, uh, the secret would be out. You'd have to bribe too many people not to, um, not to talk, which is completely false because, you know, generation after generation, villages after villages bury their dead with, buried in, with their secrets with them. And it goes on generationally speaking. So... Obviously, somebody has got something to hide, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but Daniel they're... Ellsberg, Daniel Ellsberg, who's recently left us, said that the thing that he learned in Vietnam and then working on the Pentagon Papers is that thousands of people can know about a conspiracy and don't leak it. Yeah, that's interesting to me. My my dad, who's still alive, when he was uh he just said he couldn't imagine more than 11 people keeping a secret. And I've always yeah. played with what number would it be? You know, I don't know. Well, you know? 12 even got a religion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, huh. Let's do this again, friends. Let's do this again. Uh, Guido, do you want to say anything about books coming out and you too, Eric? You know, and where yeah. to find your work? Guido first and Eric second. Oh yeah, no, no. This is this is this is for Eric. I uh I just recently sent a blurb for his uh monumental book on Elroy. It's uh, it's great. Tell us about it, Eric. Oh, well, again, it's called uh, View from Howard's Fuck Pad, uh, The Deep State, Bad White Men, and the Weird weird Noir, meaning of James Elroy. And I mean weird noir. I define it in the book. I defined it elsewhere when I wrote my book on Lovecraft. And it's really the fusion of crime and horror literary genres as a kind of a cataphysical subgenre that we haven't really gotten a handle on yet. And what I did was, and I didn't mean to start out this way, it was actually going to be a comparative study of Elroy and Chester Hines, the, the African-American crime writer who wrote the Harlem crime series. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many parallels between Elroy's work on Los Angeles and Hines' work in on Harlem, because they're both describing neo-colonial occupational paramilitary situations, in my opinion. But the Elroy thing began multiplying and multiplying and multiplying it like, you know, like there's start, it started thinking itself. And what I'm basically doing in that book is I'm using Elroy as kind of like a hermeneutic to interpret American history for the last, certainly since 1945, which is when, 1947, which is when the Black Dahlia was killed, uh, or was it 46, 46, 47, which is sort of like his... To, to Elroy, history begins with a Black Dahlia case, right? Mm -hmm. American history does. And I think he's a way of, of a, a, coming up with a hermeneutical key to interpret a lot of parapolitical and criminogenic events. Okay. And where would you, could you send me, Erica, Guido's got my email address, you know, the, the proper link people you would want people to go to to purchase your work. Uh, it would be, I, I, I stay off media as much as I can because yeah. I'm talking about de developing the inner... So the inner solitude of apophatic theology. So I don't like being on Facebook, oh, but sure. you, would go, you would go to the Punctum book. Okay, Punctum, I got that. Punctum yep. books. Punctum books. I can do that. And you can get to see the cover and the cover. Is like so cool. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, should, I deserve an artistic medal for coming up with that sucker. But yeah, you, okay. you, you enjoy, look at and, and try to keep your lunch down when you look at that. Yeah, great. <laughs> and Guido. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the book should be on Amazon in the next few weeks. Uh, the one about 9-11, the one about the incubation of Nazism, or just the shortened version of The Conjuring Hitler. Eric's written a, a great uh, forward to both. And uh, also my book on the church. And uh, I've decided to make a book out of my uh, Jesus uh, piece on the scripting of Jesus. 
uh, which was part of that collection you mentioned. And, yeah, and that's a, that, it's a really great piece. Michael, you have it now because I sent you those chapters okay. called The Political yeah. Scripting of Jesus. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, and God willing, that should be that should be on Amazon pretty soon. And I'll let you And then it, when you do the Empire and Church one specifically, because Michael wrote the uh, preface for that one, Michael we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a whole show on that one because some of it yeah. came up. Uh, Michael, uh, Greedo was saying how we're chopping it a bit. <laughs> so yeah, what? I keep asking me about it. When's that book coming up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Empire yeah, we're, and we're, Church. We're, yeah, we should. We're, we're getting close. Yeah. Well, this is great. Well, thank you everybody for listening to the Regen.